mention the Battle of Britain and you think of Spitfires. In fact, whenever I hear the sound of a Spitfire, I shudder with delight. Now, the story goes that a German officer was asked what he needed to defeat the RAF, and he said, a squadron of Spitfires. I don't think his promotion went very well after that. During 1986, I interviewed two Australians who, as young men, flew Spitfires in the Battle of Britain. The summer of 1940 was warm, skies were clear. But unlike other summers, the people didn't look skyward for threatening clouds. Hitler's plan to complete his domination of Europe was to blitz Britain into submission. Operation Eagle, its deadline, early August. August 8th, 1940, and the battle for Britain is on. 30 enemy aircraft over the channel, flying due west. They were later to be crowned the famous few, but in the beginning they were just a bunch of young men, about a thousand of them, champing at the bit to fly the finest air fighter in the world, the Spitfire. Most of them were recruited from the Royal Auxiliary Air Force, attached to universities like Oxford and Cambridge. Ian Bales was an Australian at Oxford, now a grazier and vice chairman of the Victorian Racing Club. He remembers how he leapt at the chance to fly Spitfires, and John Cock, a retired Melbourne businessman. They think about their young mates who walked from the school cricket field into war, when suddenly life was no longer a game. I think the tragedy was there were a lot of uh, young people who uh, had just finished their training and were thrust into this without any prior experience. And in some cases, I remember an instance when a pilot delivered an aircraft, a new aircraft to us, there was a mad scramble, they ref refueled it and he took off and was shot down and to this day. I, we never found out who he was. Everyone asks about the fear business and uh, yes, I suppose one was, but uh, one didn't sort of think of the fear part very much more than you did uh, playing a football match at school. But they were reunited with an old friend. A Spitfire is being restored at Point Cook Air Base, south of Melbourne. And if such a thing is possible, then three men stepped back in time. Forty years since you've seen one of those. That's quite something, isn't it? Eh? Very few Spitfires around these days. What marks this one? Four blade, eh? It must be a, what, a... Would it be a 19? Might have built that himself. See, that, that was the problem in the spit with that the fuel tank here. Yeah. Nothing in the wings. And of course, if you were hit, it was it. It was like a settling torch. Yes, I see. Remember uh, with this, uh, the, the fuel tank, I was saying, Ian, when uh, the opening of the hood, and you, in went the flames, and you had, what, three seconds to get out. Yes, you didn't have long. Ever since a few thousand Spartans successfully defended their city against 300,000 Persians at the Battle of Thermopylae, politicians have been quick to resurrect the legend of David and Goliath. Finding his Davids sitting at the controls of Spitfires and Hurricanes, Winston Churchill was quick to seize his chance and let the world know Biggles was alive and well and flying for the RAF. The propaganda film units churned out scripts straight from the boy's own annual. Any claims, Johnny? Uh, a 109 destroyed, but yes. Oh, good show. How did you get on, sir? I had a wonderful party, thanks. But the Battle of Britain was also written by a machine that knew no equal, the Spitfire, and with its running mate, the Hurricane, simply outpaced and finally humbled the Luftwaffe. And then there was the scramble. Between battles, they would grab some sleep, and through the deepest dreams, a bell would ring. Once again, they were sent out to fight another round. I think the tension was before the scramble came, when you were just waiting and wondering what was the next move, really. I don't think I consciously thought it could be me. I, I know quite a lot of pilots right at the beginning of the war who said, well, I won't make it through the war, and sure enough, they didn't. August rolled into September, an Indian summer. The Luftwaffe kept up its attacks. The young pilots had lost their bloom of youth. Battle fatigue had struck. The English continued to bury their dead, and turned to the dwindling ranks of young fighter pilots and reminded them the fate of future generations 
was in their hands. I'm one of these pilots and I'm not afraid to admit it that when the going got too rough, I'd find a big cloud and get into it because I never, one thing I didn't believe in was dead heroes. I thought anybody who believed in that type was going to get killed anyway. And uh, you can only do so much. You either run out of ammunition or you get to a point where the odds are too great. It's no good just sticking your neck out and getting killed. You might as well duck into a cloud and hide and come out the next day and fight again. Both the Luftwaffe and the RAF were feeling the strain, but Hitler was losing patience. The job should have taken days, not weeks or months. He gave the command to Goering, send up everything. If you'd been there on that clear day in September, you would have seen 1,000 German bombers and fighters swarming over the south coast. The RAF sent up all it had left. 350 Spitfires and Hurricanes. The sky was crisscrossed with vapour trails, gunfire bursts and crashing planes. Well, I think if anybody wasn't scared, they either had to be stupid or dull or something, yes. You, you, I think the big thing about it was that I was more scared going into a battle than I was afterwards. Um, when you were committing yourself to something that you didn't know what the outcome was going to be, Afterwards, however hectic it might have been, it was a matter of relief and uh, I think you unwound more the moment you stopped your engine on the ground and I've seen many of the very tough pilots there breaking down and crying.